Good afternoon, Good afternoon, everybody. everybody. All right, we have the audience is ready to respond. So I'll try. I'll do it again because I know some people are eager for this. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. All right, I uh, can tell when people are excited. Uh, if we haven't had the pleasure of meeting before, my name is Ado Dalla. I'm the executive director here at the Center for Social Innovation Toronto. On behalf of our team, on behalf of our board. And on behalf of our community, I just want to say welcome, and we're so happy to have you here for our fireside chat with Dr. Muhammad Yunus and Tanya Sermon. So on the topic of here, for those of you who have not been here before, where you are is at the Center for Social Innovation Annex. This is the building that was bought by community. And today, it is home to 250 organizations who work across a diversity of different sectors, doing different kinds of work, but have the common and shared interest in community betterment and community wealth. And together, they are part of a larger community of thousands of social entrepreneurs, innovators, artists, and activists who call CSI home. This land, specifically, as well has been the home to many communities. In fact, stretching back 15,000 years plus. And many of those communities are indigenous communities and cultures. And I want to also start by recognizing that we are here on sacred land. That land belonged to people from nations such as the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca and the Mississauga Credit River and others. And I want to acknowledge the privilege it is for us to be here today. I want to acknowledge the fact that we have the opportunity to learn what it is to uh, have truth and to reconcile with one another. And con con contextualizing that in today, in our conversation that we're going to have, uh, a lot of that conversation is going to be about where we are now and where we'd like to go. And it's important in the concept and the context of reconciliation that we do not forget our past, that we ensure that we carry those lessons forward and that we prioritize, first and foremost, our relationships with each other and with our planet. So about today, 
Um, I'll just give you a bit of a background as to why we are here. Uh, about, um, about four or five months ago, we were doing our first fireside conversation over at 192 Spadina. Uh, it was a gentleman named Ian Black. And Ian Black is uh, a, a leading social entrepreneur. Some of you may know him based in the UK. And, uh, and it was our first fireside chat. So it's, it's kind of come full circle for us. And when Ian came, he brought a, a number of his books. It's called The Social Entrepreneur's Guide, A to Z. And uh, I, was, I was reading his book in preparation for our conversation with him. And he had all these markers as to, well, what does it mean to be a social entrepreneur? You know, A for anxiety. N for network. And I got to Y, and there was the name Eunice. And so it, it's interesting because throughout the alphabet of social entrepreneurship, this was the only name that actually came up. Now, this wasn't incredibly surprising to me. Uh, about seven or eight years ago, I was working with uh, rural farmers in Tanzania on micro lending, um, a micro lending program. And at that time, the only playbook that we had was that of Dr. Eunice's. And so it wasn't incredibly surprising to see just one person's name come up in this book, but it nevertheless was pretty darn impressive. So when Barnaby Geis first said, or rather texted me saying, I need to see you on video call right now, I have some news, and shared with me this opportunity, for us to host Dr. Eunice today, and suffice to say, it was an exciting moment. And Barnaby was actually contacted by Paul Samard about the opportunity. And Barnaby and Paul you know, presented this idea of us being able to host a fireside chat today. And Barnaby also said, well, we need to make sure that we get other partners involved. And so immediately, we called our friends at Alterna. And for those of you who don't know, Alterna was the organization that first provided us with our very first bank account when nobody else would. Thank you. It is, it is a little win. Um, big wins. Alterna was also the financial institution that partnered with us to enable us to sell community bonds to our community to purchase this building. And Alterna was also the one and only organization we need to talk to to show up to support us in ensuring that we had the resources to make today happen. And so because of Paul catalyzing, because of Barnaby creating this event, and because of Alterna enabling, we're here today. And so I just want to acknowledge the three, three of these entities, three of these individuals, for the work they did to make today possible. I'd also like to acknowledge all of you. So um, first of all, you're here and showing up, as we all know, with the value of our time in itself is hugely important, so thank you. And some helpful context which you don't know is for every single ticket that was purchased for this event, we are directing that uh, towards a new training program for social entrepreneurs. And by the end of this year, we will have trained over 100 of them because of the contributions that you all made today. So thank you very much. Um, just a couple more notes, uh, just a little bit on the, the, I guess maybe the focus and the flow for tonight, or to this afternoon. Um, so there, so some of you may already know, um, there are copies of Dr. Eunice's new book available uh, to, to purchase at the cafe. Uh, and the cafe will be open throughout this time if you'd like to get anything. To manage expectations, when the, the fireside chat portion is done at 5, Dr. Eunice is actually going to go upstairs for dinner, so there won't be an opportunity to have it signed by him. If you want somebody else here to have it have sign it for you, that is possible. In fact, that's possible throughout 5 to 6 when you can sit and, and stand and mingle with folks here. Um, I know many people here in this audience, and some of you I don't know, uh, but I can tell you that this is a pretty incredible group of people, um, and it would be incredible for you to stay and, and, and chat a while. Um, the cafe will be open when we're done at 5, and from 5 to 6, you're welcome to stay, and then at 6, we're going to push you out. Not actually push you, but just gently ask you to leave because we're going to have to reset the room because we're doing this all again in the evening. Uh, and, and on that note... Um, 
uh, about the actual fireside chat itself. So momentarily, um, we're going to be joined here by Dr. Yunus and, and Tony Sermon, and they have, um, you know, they have been working in parallel, but I believe perhaps mainly have only just met in the last 15 minutes. And, uh, and I, I mentioned that just because one of the, um, one of the kind of hallmarks of us doing these fireside chats is to move away from the kind of prepared or over-prepared um, uh, stayed kind of presentations and, and create something a little bit more natural and conversational. So the idea of the fireside chat uh, is to have a conversation. And, uh, and so they've just met each other, so they're still getting to know each other, and they haven't prepared necessarily with one another which means it may be a little bit more casual, there may be a little bit more pauses than normal, but that's just, so now you know, kind of get the flow of that. Um, they're gonna talk for about an hour, or maybe a little bit less than that, and thereafter we'll open it up for questions. And so with that, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Muhammad Yunus and Tanya Sermon, who are gonna spend the next hour chatting with us, and uh, we'll give them the largest applause that we can now to welcome to the stage. Well, that was an amazingly warm welcome. That's fantastic. Hi, everyone. Um, and welcome. Welcome to the Center for Social Innovation. And welcome, Dr. Yunus. I am so excited, delighted, tickled. I'm excited, too. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, uh, how many people have been to, how many people, this is the first time that they've been to the Center for Social Innovation? Oh, wow. Look at that. Amazing. So welcome to all of you. Uh, Dill gave an amazing introduction, um, but I do feel like um, it's one of those moments, if you know me, to have an opportunity to be in the presence of somebody who I have looked up to for pretty much my entire career, uh, been inspired by, and, um, you know, you've shown the way. And I just want to say, uh, to start, thank you. Thank you. The, um, I, I know that everybody knows your story. Uh, it's, it's a hard one not to know. Um, but I wonder, I wonder if you can give a little synopsis on your like 30, 40 year journey that got you to this moment, just so we have like a, like the Coles notes In version. 40 seconds. In, well, <laughs> now you got as much time as you need, but, but, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that we can, um, that we can speak to one another, uh, a little bit about some of the struggles. Uh, that we've been through as social entrepreneurs. Um, actually, how many people in the room would would say that they define themselves as social entrepreneur? Whoa. All right. This is for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> so just by way, just give us your little Coles notes, and then we're going to jump right into this. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. I see lots of people. I can't see even the farthest part of it. Uh, delighted that you, we could meet. And uh, I feel especially privileged that you're already involved in doing things. That uh, So you have lots of experiences. We can share experiences with each other. And uh, you asked me how did it all begin. All, the first thing I should mention, it was not a pre-planned thing. I was not planning something to do. And it was more, of, more, more or less as a spur of the moment action, jumping into something that you never did before, because situation was so desperate, you had to do something. So I did something out of desperation. That was about lending money to the poor women in the village next door to the campus where I was teaching, uh, because of the loan sharking that was going on so ugly that you cannot see it every day. Every, you cannot hear all those terrible stories that they keep telling you. So one thing I thought, why don't they lend the money myself so that they don't have to go to the loan shark? So it's the easy solution. And I didn't consult with anybody or didn't think about talking to anybody. I just started giving money. said, if you need money, come to me. I'll give the money. <laughs> and at the beginning, they were hesitant whether I was another big loan shark coming in, whether I would like to do worse than what the others are doing. I said, I should, no problem. I'm not trying to squeeze your arms or something. Just lend, you give me that money back. That's all the story it is. 
So they shyly started taking money in the beginning. Then it became very popular. They said, there's nothing wrong is happening. Everything works very well. That's because I'm not asking for any big interest or something. It's very easy. Uh, they can pay me back whenever they want. So uh, it became very popular. And more and more people keep coming. And that was the starting point. At the end of it, the long story, uh, then we thought, we should, why don't we create a bank to keep on running it rather than stop it because I ran out of money and I cannot function it. So I said, why don't you create a bank? Bank will be the solution to that. That became another struggle. It's not easy to create a bank, particularly for someone who's just teaching in a university, suddenly says, I want to create a bank. And the central bank said, hey, this is not your job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I went through that process, uh, struggle to convince everybody that we need a bank for the poor people. This was a very difficult thing for people to understand in the banking world. How could you have a bank for the poor people? They don't match. Bank is supposed to be for the rich people. So I said, yes, you got, you got all the banks for the rich people. We don't have the banks for the poor people. And they couldn't understand what is a bank for the poor people. So this is what we're doing. We continue to do it. Give us the permission so that we can become a legitimate entity. So after several years of trials, we became an entity uh, as a bank. We call it Grameen Bank or a village bank. We started in 1976, we became a bank in 1983. So this period, we are doing it just a personal thing and uh, with my initiative and so on and so forth. Once we became a bank, we saw how easy it was to expand itself. So we keep on expanding more and more. And soon we became nationwide. That's <clears throat> the thing we did, lending money, became known as microcredit. Uh, we, that word didn't exist in the dictionary. So we are describing, people ask, what is it that you do? So we said, give a small loan. So people translated this small loan into saying he does microcredit. So small loans. So then it became very wide, worldwide uh, attention is drawn and many people become interested in it and gradually spread in around the world. And from either it's microfinance or microcredit, this, these are the two words being said. Along the way, we uh, started looking at other problems besides the financial problems, uh, solve people's uh, problems, uh, housing, sanitation, malnutrition, uh, healthcare in general, energy. So every time I look at a problem, I try to find a solution. The solution that I find, I try to do it in a business way. So for every problem, I create a business to solve that problem. So, and there are so many problems, so I have so many pro businesses running. <laughs> so we have nearly 60 different companies that we created to solve different kinds of problems. So there's a kind of a series of companies that I created. Now we have more than 60 companies, some of them nationwide companies, big companies. Uh, so we call them social business because we don't want to make money out of it. It's all dedicated to solving problems. This is what I will do. Thank you. So, so that's amazing. And I guess I guess I want to dig into this question. Why? Why a business? I mean, why solve problems with business? It seems yeah, if a you have a problem, if you have a problem, traditionally there are two ways of solving them. One, you do it um, you create a business to make money, taking advantage of people's need, people's problem. Like loan sharking is a business. Solve the problem of the people to have the money. So you make the solution in such a way, uh, it does more harm to people than you uh, started to solve. You, your attention was not solving the problem. You took advantage of the problem to create a business to make money for you. That's a loan sharking and all the things that you see in there. And in that category, you'll see many, many such things in, in healthcare, in housing, and all that. Other way of solving that is charity. They need money, okay, here is the money. I give you the money, free money. Uh, more and more, to address the problems of the poor people, charity became the most reliable thing everywhere because it goes and it solves the problem. What I felt right from the beginning, uh, charity is a great idea. It solves people's problem. That's how people survived all these years because people came with charity solutions. But one problem I saw in the charity, the charity, when you try to solve the problem with charity, charity money goes out, solves the problem, money doesn't come back. So you have only one time use of the money. So I thought, why don't they do it separate, differently? 
so that I can get the money back. So I took that objective of the charity, put a business engine behind it, so that the money goes out, does the job, and comes back, because it's a business now. So then the same money can be used again and again, because money goes out, does it, comes back, and you send it again, does it, come back, and send it again. It's endless use of the same money. Yep. So that is the big power. So I said, why should I go the charity route? Why don't I create a business route? But business route I did in the, different than the conventional business. In conventional business, you want to take advantage of the problem to make money. I said, no, I'm not interested in making money for myself. I'm interested in just solving the problem. So I solved the problem, get the money back, and I send the money back again without any intention of making personal money out of it. That's what I started calling social business. Non-dividend company to solve human problems. This is different than the conventional business where you want to do business to make money. That's the difference between them. And, and you know, I often describe money as energy. Uh, you know, it's a way of containing energy and then being able to trade it and exchange it. And one of the things is if we uh, give through charity, that energy is going into something, but it doesn't have any kind of um, flow back. And so I think one of the things that's so exciting about looking at social enterprise is really looking at how we as social entrepreneurs can take that energy, which is embodied in money, and start to actually scale the kind of impact that we want. Until we actually use some of these um, business approaches, I think we end up in a situation where we can never scale our impact and never get to actually achieving the change that we want to see. And so, you know, I think that this is a, sometimes I remember when I started in my own work, it was you know, the idea of environment and economy together in the same sentence was unheard of. I mean, some of you Canadians out there might remember the National Roundtable on Environment and Economy, and it was heresy that you could actually say those two words in the same business. And now we have the, the fellow who actually coined the term clean tech here in the room, and I think he would tell you, uh, Nick will, Parker will tell you that environment and energy is just good business. So, I mean, I think you've got a group who are pretty convinced on this side, but I guess I want to go back to those early years and talk to you, but you made that growth sound so easy. Oh, you know, between 1976 and 1983, we just, you know, created a bank and, you know, beat up the regulators and took care of all that stuff. And then everybody came and it magically just happened. And like, I just want to call, I just want to call this out here. It wasn't that easy. I want to know a little bit about some of the, um, a challenge or two and how you got past it and how you dealt with people who were um, resistant to change. Well, now you open a new box. You bet. <laughs> <laughs> we can spend the whole night on that one. Darn right. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you do something new, you invite trouble for yourself. Darn right. So we invite a lot I don't know that. anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> So I invited a lot of trouble doing that. And the first trouble, uh, you can imagine right away, uh, as we are lending money, we made uh, loan sharks very unhappy. <laughs> so they wanted to get even with us, uh, trying to get us out of the uh, this business. So they started opposing in a very smart way, uh, spreading rumors against us. Uh, these guys, you know who these guys are? Why they're giving the money? Uh, people say, why? why? Because, oh, did you ever heard of anybody giving you money with no papers, nothing, and give just the money? They must have something in their mind. So you think it's not just simple money giving. It's, there is a, some motive behind it. What is the motive? These guys actually are Christian missionaries. Mm. You so know, they accused you of being a Christian yeah, I'm missionary. Yeah, a Christian missionary. <laughs> uh, but they, they look like us. Aha, they look, they look like, like you. <laughs> <laughs> but they are being paid by the Christian missionaries to do the job for them. In the past, Christian missionaries used to come here and they set up schools and your children get education. You get great admiration for them and take advantage of that admiration and convert your children into Christian. Or they will open a hospital, and you, they treat you and so on, and then convert you into Christian. Now, these are old games. People found out the trick. They come up with a new trick. This time, they give you money. 
and you're so mesmerized by the kindness of those people and so on. And soon they will come with their <laughs> book and convert you. So, and everybody gets very scared. Oh my God, I don't want to get into this trouble. So those kind of, one after, this is just one yeah, piece. Yeah. There yeah. are rumors after rumors and so on. This is one class. Another class is uh, the men, because we are focusing on women. Mm. Men were very angry. Is the husband of the woman that we are lending money to. It's not somebody else. It became the opposition leader against us, <laughs> fighting against us, mm -hmm. because he felt we are insulting him mm -hmm. by giving money to his wife, not to him. Mm -hmm. So he is campaigning, this is wrong, etc., etc., then collaborated with the religious people. Religious people became active, saying that this is, you are destroying the religion, Islam. Because you are giving money to women, now they will be set, getting out of the house, they will setting up their business in the mm -hmm. marketplace, they will be uh, meeting everybody uh, in the marketplace. They're not supposed to get out of the house. What did you do on that one? That's like a huge cultural It's a big thing. Each one is a cultural thing. It's yeah. a big, big issue. Every one of them is a big issue. And when you get involved with the religious issue, it's very sensitive. Yeah. Very sensitive. They, they don't ask for any explanation, any arguments or anything. So, and people are so mad at us because we are destroying the religion and, and the mullahs were giving all kinds of... Uh, uh, explanation that these people are uh, against Islam. They've been trained. And I was uh, in the USA for my education. He has been trained by them to, so right. that they can destroy, destroy your religion and so on. So this has become sensitive. So we have to work on them. We cannot just say, that, no, this is not true. So we have to convince them, village after village, people after people, to convince. And luckily, we came out with a way to handle it in a, in a religious way so that they can, we can communicate. One thing, um, among many things we did, one thing worked very well. Uh, this was a very simple message. We said, you know, if you want to be a good Muslim, you have to follow the footsteps of the Prophet. And everybody understands that. Yes, you follow the footsteps of the Prophet if you want to be a good Muslim. You know what? When Prophet was a young man, what did he do? He took a job under a woman, a businesswoman. <laughs> so if you want to be a good Muslim, you have to find a businesswoman to work under. Then you'll be a good Muslim. <laughs> I like the way this sounds. <laughs> and later on, later on, Prophet married this woman. She was older than him. So this message is very clear. If you want to be a good Muslim, you have to marry a businesswoman. <laughs> <laughs> and if you can't find a businesswoman in your village, we have a lot of them. <laughs> we'll introduce you to them. So it was fun, but very serious message. Nobody could deny any one of this, any piece of that story. So this is one way. So Islam is not against business, not against women doing business. Because it's very clear, because this was all the thing that you learned from your history of the Islamic history and Prophet's life and so on. So those are the kind of things. We, mm -hmm. They attack us, we turn them back, say, mm -hmm. this way. So this is a series of things. It's, as I said, it will take the whole <laughs> evening and the whole night to talk about this. But you don't get cowed down by all this. Because if you're doing something, uh, building a new road, you have obstacles after obstacles. You go through it. In some way, you have to be stubborn uh, to make it happen. If you get very cautious, very concerned, oh, no, this cannot be done, then you're finished. You, you have to turn down. You go back. So we, we, we saw that this is the right thing, and you have to continue that. And there are people who are supporting you gradually. There are people who are opposing you. At the same time, you're building up people who are supporting you. And then we got into political problems. Political problems at that time, this is this. These are the mid-70s and the early 80s that we are talking about in Bangladesh. And the politics is very hot at that time. Uh, uh, the, the leftists, particularly uh, uh, with the uh, extreme left, uh, the guerrilla fighters and so on and so forth in Bangladesh, uh, they were accusing us that we are agents of capitalism. We are bringing capitalism in the grassroots to the poor people so that they are not excited about the socialist revolution. 
So this, he is the enemy of the socialist revolution, uh, killing the spirit of socialist revolution among the people by giving them opium, little money, so that they see they get busy with this little money and they don't pay, pay attention to the bigger issues and so on. So we became the agents of CIA, agents of capitalist system and so on and so forth. So, and you have to deal with them because these are people with guns and they can do anything and they threaten us with their guns, they come and threat our people. Uh, so this is one. Extreme right had a completely different view of us. They thought these are communist people <laughs> organizing the poor people. They tried a lot of other means. Nobody responded. Now they are trying to find a way to get everybody together. And mo they are doing it with women. You know why? Because they are the gullible people. You can tell them anything. They believe in you. So they will organize them, they will organize their families to them, and then they will come back with the political power by mobilizing them. And one day they will call for a revolution. And this. So you have a two different views at the same time. One, they think we are CIA agent. Then it's a country that you meet everybody, you know everybody, uh, at the, particularly at the top, you know each other. And I know the uh, communist leaders, I know the extreme right leaders. I said, I said, you figure out what kind of role we are playing. <laughs> You are always talking about it. I tell the leftist people, I said, well, you know what? We are only uh, uh, 50 villages we are working right now. Bangladesh has 80,000 villages. You better bring your socialist revolution very fast because soon we'll have from 40, 50 villages, we'll have 500 villages, 1,000 villages. You'll be losing all those villages. But you still, we have so, you have so many villages where we have not entered yet. So you better get the revolution quickly before we get into it. Otherwise, you'll be in trouble. So, so we make jokes. They understand, but they want to be that serious about it. No, no way you can take do, do this to us. So this, this is a political situation. So politics is one, and also religion is another one. Men, women thing, another one. So we are kind of um, in the opposite side of many issues. So we had to struggle with that. Yeah, it sounds good stories. You're right. We probably could be here. Um, one of the things that uh, is interesting and just reflecting on this is, and then you went and you created a bank. And I'm sure that the banks just loved that uh, and, and wonder, um, you know, my own personal experience when we uh, introduced the community bond here in Toronto and in Canada um, I really had these great ambitions that the community bond was an idea that could be replicated, that people, you know, everybody could be investors in this and that we could become, uh, you know, co-creators of, of community infrastructure with this, this new tool. And, and one of the challenges that we faced is when we first did it, when we did the community bond to buy this building, we had found a little loophole in the retirement savings plan that allowed mortgages to be held inside an RSP, a retirement savings plan for Canadians. Well, right after we successfully did that, we had about 20 or 30 people put their community bond in an RSP, the banks discontinued uh, allowing mortgages to be held inside these RSPs. Well, when we went to go buy our next building at 192, I wanted to use that community bond, that RRSP bond um, again. And of course, they'd closed this. They made it impossible. And I swear to God, I have been a part of teams that have changed laws in this country. But you think I could get those the established banks to be able to actually do this very small little thing? It was the most... I've never cried out of a meeting before, like the day when they were like, yeah, it was like a stone wall, impossible to change. And so I, I guess like my own personal experience is that that bureaucracy was so challenging and, and it just was, it felt like such a giant um, wall uh, of inaction. And I guess I'm, I'm curious, did you try to, and with all of your work around microcredit, watching how some institutions adopt microcredit or create an alternative mechanism. One of the things I guess I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on is, you know, do we need to create these things ourselves or do we work with institutions to be able to get them to adopt 
more better practices. And, and I think this might be a little bit of a segue into some of your more current work and some of the work that you've done with corporations and other institutions. I'd love you to share your thoughts on that because I often feel this struggle. Do we, do we partner or do we have to do it ourselves? I'll say all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> you try whatever works at that moment, particular moment. Uh, you have the tactics, you have the strategy. So you have to make very clear what is your strategy, what is your tactics, and so on. Uh, so for the time being, you want to get things done, you make compromises, you work uh, collaboratively and do that. But that doesn't mean that's the end of it. It's simply I'm crossing the problem that I have at the moment, but my destination is very clear where I want to go. So I don't forget the destination. I make a little detour here and there, but I know the direction where I'm going to go. So that has to be very clear. Uh, bureaucracy everywhere is very difficult. It's a government bureaucracy is difficult. Financial bureaucracy is difficult. So you name it, they're bureaucracy and you're not favorable to you because you're bringing something new. And bureaucracy doesn't like anything new. Bureaucracy wants to be cookie cutter as it is told and it's exactly fit into it. If there's a comma missing here, there's a period missing here, they don't like that. They said, no, 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 you don't fit in that slot. We have to fix it up, otherwise it won't work. Uh, so you have to figure out how to work through that uh, bureaucracy jungle and make this path through that. Uh, and that was one reason why we wanted to create a bank. Not only we wanted to create a bank, creating a bank was rather easy for us, but we didn't want the bank. We want a special bank. We need a law for our bank, separate law, see? I'm insisting I cannot create a bank using the existing banking law, create a bank for the poor, because existing banking law only creates bank for the rich. That's how it is designed. I said architecture of the banking law, the way it has been designed, is particularly suitable for the purpose that we see they're doing that. And I gave examples of saying, like, uh, I said, you have the super tanker in the ocean, which is a huge big ship, carries a lot of uh, cargo in it, and go to the deep sea. That's a super tanker, huge, huge ship. I said, that's the architecture of the conventional bank. It's a super tanker. It goes in the deep ocean and go distances. What I'm looking for is the architecture of a dinghy boat, <laughs> <laughs> which goes into shallow water. And those super ship will never be able to come anywhere near it. So they have to go into shallow water, go to the people which other ships cannot go. I need a new architecture for that. Architecture is the law. So you have to create that architecture by the law so that I can create it. I know what it is, but I need the law, law to support it, to do that. So that became the biggest struggle. Finally, I got through. So when I say we created a bank, doesn't mean I have I was coming to the banking law. I didn't come to the banking law. I came through a Grameen Bank's special law. So it designed exactly the way we wanted to create this bank, which is completely different from the conventional. Everything conventional banks do, we do the opposite. <laughs> they go to the rich, we go to the poor. They go to the city, big city, big business center, we go to the remote village. Yeah. We work, the more remote we get, more excited we get. Mm -hmm. They want to do the rich, they want to give the loan to the richest person. The richer you are, happier they are. Mm -hmm. We turn it around. Poorer you are, excited we are. Mm -hmm. If you're the poorest, we get the most excited. Here we found the person that we want to do business with. Uh, they want collateral. We dismissed all collateral from our system. No collateral whatsoever. In Grameen Bank, we tell people that we are the only bank in the whole world which is lawyer-free. <laughs> we don't have any lawyer. We don't have any legal papers in our business. We give billions of dollars in loans in totality. Each loan is small. The total loans in each year turns into several billion dollars. New papers. And people say, oh, my God, what happens if they don't pay back? I said, why should I think about it? They always pay back. In case they I said, why should I think about it in case? Because for the last 41 years, they have been paying it. So why do you make me think about something? Yeah. 
Yes. I said, can you sleep at night? <laughs> I said, I have perfect sleep. I have no problem. I'm worrying about you, bankers. You, you are losing your sleep, worrying about me. Yeah. 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 I, you know, I, I, I remember when we opened up CSI uh, 14 years ago, and the number one barrier that we had was you're not allowed to have a tenant without them having insurance. Right. You needed to have some sort of general liability or operating insurance. I don't even remember what kind it was. And, you know, as a landlord, you're supposed to have a piece of paper. Now, we were trying to do exactly the same. We're saying, no, we're trying to support tiny little organizations. You know, the idea that they're paying, you know, $1,500 a year for more insurance is exactly antithetical <laughs> to what we're, you know, we want them to save that money and put it towards their growth and their development. And I remember us getting to big fights with the insurance companies. And my answer to them in those early days was, I'll take responsibility. Like, I don't care. Like, I'm not worried about this. I think everybody's going to be just fine. And it was really, I think it's very interesting hearing your story about the law, about the role of lawyers. Actually, my lawyer's in the room and he's having a fit right now. I know he's in here. Uh, but, but it's a really interesting thing, what you can accomplish when you're willing to just ignore the fear based piece here, right? Like we have developed such a society, uh, of fear of liability of insurance of what happens if, and I see it in our parenting and it's everywhere where it's like, we're just living in fear. And it's, it's so interesting to hear the way that you have embodied, you know, the use of the markets, you know, how do you use markets and, and, and facilitate the systems change at the same time? And I've been studying somebody you may know, an incredible thinker by the name of Indy Jahar, who's out of the UK. And he introduced me to this term called systems venturing. And when I hear your story, it seems like a, a quite an amazing and insightful example where what you're doing is you're creating the system at the same time as you're employing the market tools in order to redesign and restructure the economy so that we can get it right. And I think that that's, I mean, to me, it's extraordinary uh, to, to hear that story and to think about the potential that, and the amount of work that we all have to do to be able to, to get that, to get that economy right. And that kind of leads me into thinking about, um, well, actually capitalism and, and the work that you're doing now uh, with with the Unis centers and moving into the social business space, and you know maybe just give us a bit of an overview of the of the work and the kinds of businesses that you're starting and and the the why of those. Because I'd love to get a a little bit of a, an overview from you. Again, again, it was not pre-planned or anything. I, as I see things, uh, I try to think about the solution. How do we address this issue? How do I solve this issue for them? And these issues come because we are working with the poor people, particularly poor women. Uh, one thing right away comes to your attention. If somebody is poor, she's also poor in health because uh, these two go together. Uh, it's, uh, it's two sides of the same coin, poor and poor health. So the women are particularly uh, vulnerable but, uh, about the health problems. And the children. So we see them every day. So uh, I, I was particularly struck with one problem that I see in the beginning, in every home that I meet them. The children in those families cannot see after sun goes down. They become blind. I had no idea that such thing existed. And I talked to the doctors, what is this problem? Children cannot see anything after the sun goes down. They told me that it's called night blindness. It's a disease with that name, night blindness. I said, that's horrible. What do you do with that? Would they really go blind after that? No, no, it's a simple thing. This is because of the vitamin A deficiency. And it is a very simple cure. Give them vitamin A tablets. Or... Let them uh, uh, eat green vegetables with lots of vitamin A. So I thought maybe I should follow the vitamin, I mean, uh, the 
vegetable option. It's easy. I can't ask them to go and buy the vitamin tablets and so on. Uh, if I tell them, that, why don't you eat vegetables and feed your children with vegetables? So I try to explain this to the women that we work with. They listen, they understand, but they don't do anything about it. They thought, why this trouble? This is a disease we all know, familiar with it. So I tried to find alternative way how to make this happen. So I came out to an idea that why don't you start bringing vegetable seeds to them so that once they have the seed in their hand, they'll probably sprinkle it around and it will grow. A simple thing. Again, I didn't want to give them free seeds. Seed is okay, but not free seeds. I have to sell this seed to them. So how do I make it attractive for them to buy the seed, pay the cash for that? Made that one penny packet. Looks beautiful packet with the one penny worth of seeds, quite a number of them. And as our staff go to the villages doing the uh, banking with them, they carry the seed packets with them and tell them if anybody is interested in buying it, here is the seed. So in the beginning, one or two, three or four will buy. But the next round, there will be more people buying. And next round, there are more people buying. It became very popular seed because they never saw such beautiful vegetable before that. This seed they never saw before. As they were buying, their neighbors were buying because the seed is pretty good. These vegetables look very good. So as Grameen Bank grew, our seed business grew. At one point, we became the largest vegetable seed seller in the whole country. And by that time, night blindness disappeared from the country. So that gave us a lot of courage that we can do things. You don't need doctor. Healthcare doesn't mean doctor. Mm -hmm. Healthcare means many other things like this. And the next one is the sanitation. So we wanted to make sure everybody has a latrine and the toilet. People never had a toilet in the villages. Poor, rich, doesn't matter, no toilets. They just go out in the open. We said, no, if you want to join Grameen Bank, you have to have a toilet. So started with the digging hole, using it, the open toilet, and then give them the loan to buy sanitary latrine with the water seal latrine designed by UNICEF and so on. So we produce it in the village, give them the loan, they pay them, and set it up, and everybody has a sanitary latrine. So as you join Grameen Bank, gradually you have a sanitary latrine. So one after another, we try to address that. And every time we do that, I try to do it in a business way so that I can sustain it, continue it. Same with the seeds, same with the sanitary latrine. It became a business, not only just for the Grameen borrowers, Grameen, non Grameen people who were needing this sanitary latrine and so on. Uh, because the women started complaining to their husbands, well off families and so on. Even the beggar woman has a toilet. How come we don't have toilets? This became a big issue. So husband had to come to our production center to buy those things, set it up in their homes because they need it. Because women felt it very strongly because they cannot go out of the house during the daytime. Men can do it anytime they want, but not women. So they had to suffer a lot. They saw this is a escape route. If you have a toilet, you can go anytime you want. But if you don't have, then you wait. So there's a tremendous pressure on the husbands and the male folks in the family. So Bangladesh became one of the countries which is uh, almost 100% with the toilet facilities in the villages and so on, which many countries don't have. So because one thing led to another, so we felt good about it. And we did it in a business way. We, we didn't go for the donors to give us money to set up 100 toilets here or 200 toilets there. We do it in hundreds of thousands, not one or two of them, because we do it in a business way. So there are a series of them. Each one has a long history, but we start, tried it, and it worked, and do that one after another. Amazing. Amazing. Um, have you heard of the circular economy? Yes. Yeah. It, it sounds so similar in some ways, and you're kind of looking at how you are creating and addressing piece by piece by piece. And I think there's something about that, which we'll come back to. That's from my friend Kim in the room. It's, yeah, there she is. She just got finished her master's in the circular economy. And I've been talking to her about a post-capitalist vision. 
can we get to circularism? But I'm not going there yet. I want to okay. go there, but I'm going to go there yet. Um, I guess I, I, you, you've done so much work in, in the developing world and have inspired so many. And then you've started to bring all of this thinking into the developed world. And I would love to hear your thoughts on what's different, what's different, what's the same, and what the struggles have been as these ideas have gone global, and now we're looking at how they are impacting the developed world. What, what's, which perspectives can you share on that with us? Yeah. Uh, one time I was invited to come and visit uh, Norway. Um, in early 90s because uh, they are uh, uh, they are celebrating their first anniversary of Grameen program in Norway. Mm -hmm. I said, Norway, Grameen program? How did it go there? Yeah. We don't know anything <laughs> about it. Uh, so I was curious and I, uh, I said, okay, I'll come. I'll see what is happening. This is way up in the north of Norway called Lofoten Islands. Mm -hmm. There's a cluster of islands up in the north. Uh, only pro uh, livelihood they have is uh, uh, catching fish from the sea. They are all fishermen in the village. So the problem that they had, the reason they got into Grameen program there, the problem they had, government of Norway introduced a law making sure all ch young people have education. Even in the remotest place, they have college education and so on. Government support all the things. So the, all these young people from these villages, uh, from these islands, these are little islands, some 300 people, some 200 people in that village. That's it. They are sending their children to go to cities in, uh, in the mainland Norway. And both boys and girls when they are edu for education. Boys had their education, came back to the village, uh, to their islands, to their profession, catching fish, which is their traditional business. The girls, when they had education, never came back. Hmm. It started creating a big social problem for these islands. Boys come back, girls don't come back. And then boys started leaving the islands because there's no girl in there. So they said, well, <laughs> we go. It is how it works. Yeah. <laughs> and Norwegian so government became very concerned about the whole problem because these are becoming depopulated. Right. They are worried that sometime Russia will take it over because these are all between the Russia and the things close by because they are just come and settle there and start fishing because there's nobody there. So they wanted to keep the Norwegian people there. One woman in the fisheries ministry of Norway, her husband used to work as a consultant to the Norwegian uh, aid agency NORAD and he spent a lot of time in Bangladesh as a consultant. And he, she visited her husband in Bangladesh and lived in the village to see what's going on in the Norwegian program. But she got so mesmerized seeing Grameen Bank working in the village. So she watched it, she documented every detail, details of it. This program, when, when this problem arose, she said, only solution we have for those islands is to introduce microcredit in Grameen Bank in the land. So she introduced the Grameen Bank program there so that the girls will come back so that they have their own identity. They will have independent entrepreneurship and so on. And if the girls come back, then the boys will come back and boys will stay there. And that was the beginning of it. Now there's a flourishing microcredit program in those villages. I was attending the 15th anniversary of that program again after the first anniversary. It's all over the, it's spilled in the Swedish part of the area because there's all Sweden, Russia, and Norway all mixed together in the, in the north. Now you have microcredit program, Grameen program in Sweden, you have Grameen program in Russia, you have Grameen program in Norway. And across the whole of north, uh, from north to south, there's a microcredit program. It's not me, I didn't do anything. Somebody got so Touched, taken by it. She took the challenge and started doing that. Now it's a spread. So, so one after another, similar thing happened in uh, France. Uh, Dr. Maria Nowak, who used to work in uh, uh, World Bank. She heard about uh, microcredit, Grameen Bank. She came to Bangladesh, stayed in Bangladesh to understand what it is. And she said, oh my God, I'm going to do it in France because I have to do it because uh, France needs this as much as Bangladesh needs it. So she created a whole network of microcredit program in uh, France. So one country after another country started doing that, and that's how it is spread in different countries. Yeah. 
Amazing. And so, so, you know, you're casting a vision and increasingly you've, and in, in, in your most recent book have really cast this vision uh, around um, the potential of, of social businesses to transform capitalism. So I'm, I'm going to go there now. I've been dying to get there, but it's like, you know, how, I guess I'm, I'm really curious. Like there's a, there's a debate in our country around, you know, do we, do we need, um, do we engage these tools? Or are the tools broken and we need to find another way? And how do we, you know, and I'll just throw in because it'll all be connected, you know, this question of scale, like all of the examples, you know, so much of where we're at in the social business space or the social enterprise space, we're still so small. You know, in our work at CSI, we're constantly struggling just to even find viable investments. Like the capacity is low, our our challenges are high, finding the financing is so challenging. And it's this... Um, you know, we're still such an infinitesimal, uh, um, uh, little, not even a dent on the larger economy. And, um, oh, so many different directions. But <laughs> I guess just, you know, maybe cast this vision, get us to believe that this, that this has scale, that this is the right route. And like, you know, where, where does this all lead us? Or are we engaging, you know, in, in a, in a kind of insane process where really we're, you know, we're just still coping with a broken system. So just talk to me about that because I, I want to uh, go. <laughs> let me just touch on the replication or expansion mm, part yeah. of it. We never worried about it at all. Once we did the first branch, uh, people are running around to have the uh, other people are lining up to do that. So we have to open another branch. And we had Set, open any number of branches you want. There's no problem. So we take only young people to come and train to become our staff of the branch. Yep. So we bring them in. We bring the young people to become a manager of each branch. When we are, training is over, it's a three months, six months uh, training period of becoming a branch manager, fresh new branch manager. After it's completed, we give him a name of the village that where you have to work, go there. So we gave the name and the address and say, go there, set up a government bank branch. We don't give you any money and we don't give you any staff. You are by yourself. <laughs> the poor guy has to go there because he has been trained how to do that. He finds out where this village is, very remote place. He comes, yes, this is the village I'm supposed to work. He has no money, bank has not given him money because you have to raise the money in the village. So first thing he goes around, his first duty is for first few weeks, he has to go walk everywhere in the village to draw a map of the whole village in details. The roads, houses, where the poor, poor people live, where the marketplace, where the mosque, where the school, so that you become familiar with the place before you even open your mouth about your business. So that you become part of it. You know everything. When you shut your eyes, you know everything about the village. Mm -hmm. And then you talk to the people in the village, those who are well-off people. They look, I've been sent by Grameen Bank to open a branch here. Oh, they become very curious. Yes, yes, we need a Grameen Bank branch. Everybody wants to have a Grameen Bank branch. Okay, we'll do that. Uh, I'm inviting you all to come on such and such place on Sunday at uh, 3 o'clock. We'll discuss how do you do that. So they will be curious and come to the place to listen to the manager. Said, uh, I want to do that, but you have to provide the money to start that. So we, I need X amount of money to do the first year job. You can transfer your bank account from any other bank because there is no bank in this village or anywhere near it. You have to go to the city to keep your money in the city. Just transfer the money to our bank account. Where is your bank? I don't see any bank. Oh, if you agree, then we'll have a bank. If you don't agree, I go to the next village. <laughs> they say, no, 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 don't give to the next village. We'll give you. We we'll stay here. You stay here. We'll mobilize the money. Say, how long? I can give you two weeks. After that, if you don't come up with the money, where I go. Because my instruction is very clear. If you're not interested, I'm not going to do it. You have to be interested. So how do we do it? You bring, transfer your money to the bank. The moment you agree, some of you agree, I'll put up the sign, I'll put up the location, here's a formal bank for you. So far, I have nothing. So people promise, and the next day, they will have set up another day, they will bring money in baskets and pockets and so on, 
deposit the money, get the receipt that I have deposited X amount of money, and this you're opening. Then you start forming the groups in the villages and start giving the money that you already got. Where do you keep this money? You just go to the city where the bank branch is, deposit the money in your account, because you don't have anything, any facility here. And that's the start. The job is within the next four years, he has to create that bank branch and cover all the cost of the branch by the operation that he does. Simple. We didn't send any money. It's a locally mobilized money. So I can create any number of branch I want. And as a result, we cover every village of 80,000 villages in Bangladesh. We have no problem. To give you a similar idea, just similar, we started uh, something called Grameen America in the USA. 10 years back in 2008, 27th of January, in Jackson Heights, New York, I sent someone from Bangladesh to come and set up a branch exactly the same way that I do it in Bangladesh. Go and open a branch. Talk to people who would like to invest in that branch. If they are not, you come back. You don't need it. Because they promise that they will provide the money. There's a long debate and discussion. Out of that discussion, I sent the money. Uh, sent the person. So he, they gave the money, and they started it. And it became a beautiful branch, functioning, following every single rule that we have in Bangladeshi village. We have not compromised on anything just because he is in Jackson I said, you follow every single rule. Nothing to eliminate, nothing to drop. It became successful branch. So other areas, other boroughs of New York, they said, we need the branch. You did it in Queens, we need it in Harlem, we did it here. I said, very simple. You give us the money and we'll send the people to do it. If you want it, it's X amount of money. How much money? Six million dollars for four years. You give us six million dollars and we start the project. If you're not interested, forget it. We don't have it. And everybody said, we'll provide the money. So we have seven branches in New York City now. And every city, other city comes. We want to have the same thing. Put the $6 million and we come. And now we have 20 branches in 12 cities with 100,000 borrowers, with $1 billion in loan, and perfect repayment, 100% repayment. Working. And I keep telling that if all other cities that will put the money, $6 million per branch, I can do it all over the United States. There's no problem. All you need is one person to go and start it and train up the people and don't do it. So today, all those people are trained up, the local people are trained up, they're running these 20 branches, and more and more branches come up. Anybody says, we can do that. So they want to expand it to 50 branches, 100 branches, similar way. So, so what, I'm, what I'm hearing, first of all, awesome. And what I'm hearing is that you're, um, let me see if I'm just reading this right, is that the, the, the belief is that if we're able to replicate in a micro way to involve community in the, at the grassroots level. I mean, basically in Canada, we have an incredible history of community economic development uh, in, this, in this country where, you know, it's very much been about community enterprise and about how we are working together to co-create solutions. Um, so what you're, what you're hypothesizing here is that we're able to, through the power of a really good business model and a replicable concept that we really can uh, achieve those goals of zero, 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 if we're able to leverage the power of these business models and to replicate, replicate, replicate. So I think that's a bold vision. How do we, let's say, let's say we can even do that. And so we're able to uh, include the marginalized and, and address the issues around employment and climate and, and, uh, and housing and, and so on there's still this sort of fundamental question of how we're integrating or interfacing with mainstream capitalism and with corporations and with uh, the, the, the form, which seems to be wildly out of control, where this invisible hand seems to be uh, pushing us into ways that are continue to push us towards our own destruction. And I wonder how you, uh, this is my last question because I've been told I have to open it up to questions. So, um, but how do you reconcile that in your own mind? Well, since I got involved with the microcredit poor and poverty and so on, people keep asking me, what is the basic reason for poverty? Why people remain poor or become poor? My standard answer is 
poverty is not created by the poor people. Poverty is created by the system that we practice. That is the cause of poverty. So if you want to overcome poverty, change the system. Nobody will be poor. It's not created by the person. It's imposed by the system. So once you agree that it's imposed by the system, go back to the system, fix it up. I said, I tried to fix it up in an institutional way. The banks don't work for them, I create a bank so that they can have one. But this is only one. There are many other issues. Two issues that I mentioned very quickly. One, I said, capitalist system totally misinterpret human beings. And that is the cause of all the trouble that we make ourselves. They assume that all human beings are driven by self-interest, meaning selfishness. So all human beings are driven by selfishness. So the whole world became a selfish world because that's what it does. As a result, everything that we do is for selfishness, for my me. I want to be beneficiary of that thing. So I don't see my neighbor, I don't see my brother, I don't see my sister, I don't see anybody else. It's me. I want to make, because that's the only thing I do. As a result, the whole system is just a greed-based system which pushes wealth from the bottom to the top. That's how it goes. And all the institutions are built for that. As a result, all the wealth of the world now is concentrated in few hands. 1% of the entire world's population, 8 billion people, 1% of them own 99% of the wealth of the entire world. And tomorrow, it will be less than 1% people, more than 99% of the world. That's the direction it's going. I said, this is a ticking time bomb. It will explode anytime. Because people will not just sit there and watch you become fatter and fatter. I don't get anything. I said, this is like a mushroom of wealth, huge mushroom of wealth. All the wealth is there, but only a handful of people own that mushroom. And the stem of that mushroom, which is the wealth of the remaining people, 99.9% .9 of the people, that stem is becoming thinner. Mushroom is getting bigger. So whether you look at the globally, whether you look at the country by country in the USA, I'm sure you've been hearing Bernie Sanders again and again telling during the campaign that one-tenth of one percent of the population of the United States own more wealth than the bottom 40 percent of the population of the United States. He also mentioned that one family in the United States own more wealth than the bottom 50 percent of the population of the entire country. So this is the kind of wealth. You look at Canada, you'll see the same thing. Recently an information was published in India, 1% of the Indian owns 73% of the wealth of the entire India, 1%. So same thing here. So I said, do you call it an economic system or it's a mockery of a system? If that is the only way you can do that. So we have to find a way how to stop the concentration of the wealth, how to slow down the speed of concentration. First, you cannot stop. You have to slow down the speed of concentration because it's going every day, every second. It's making more and more people more wealthy. Uh, and how to bring it to zero speed so that it stays the way the mushroom and the stem as it is. It doesn't change. But that's not the end of it. We have to reverse it. Make it the other way so that the wealth starts from the mushroom to the people. So 99% of the people. How do you do that? I said one way that we have been trying, saying that interpretation of human being is wrong, is not only selfish, they're also selfless. But you have not included selflessness into economic theory. If you have done that, then you have a business based on selflessness. You have a business based on selfishness, but no business on selflessness. That's what we bring in, social business. Once you do that, social business doesn't contribute to the wealth concentration because I'm not taking any profit out. So that all the wealth remains with the business, not to a person. So that is only dedicated to solving problems. So suddenly you have slowed down your speed because I'm part of me or whole of me is dedicated to social business. The other part quickly, I want to finish. Uh, capitalist system did another wrong thing. They asked, they told that only thing every human being can do is to get a job. It's a job-oriented society, community they have built. I said job is an entirely wrong idea. Human beings are not born to work for somebody else. This, the only capitalist system told us to do that. It's, it's only the recent phenomenon. In the entire history of mankind, 
we are not working for anybody for a wage or a salary. When you are in the caves, we are not sending job applications to anybody. We just got things done ourselves. That's our history. So we became farmers, we became go-getters, we became hunters. That's our history. But suddenly capital system, no, no, you have to work for somebody. I said, that's where we went wrong. Yeah. Who do we work for? We work for the people who are concentrating their wealth. Yeah. So we became the mercenary for them. I said, we are basically entrepreneurs. Why don't we become entrepreneurs? All human beings are entrepreneurs. Look at the microcredit program. Mm -hmm. What are they doing with this small loan? All these women, illiterate women, millions and millions of them, they become entrepreneurs. If illiterate women can become entrepreneurs with $30, $40, $50 loan, what's the problem with the educated people? Why do they have to find a job? Why don't they become uh, entrepreneurs themselves? Mm -hmm. Simply our education system distorted their mind, saying that, no, you have to have a job. Job, it's a, basically human beings are all creative beings. Mm -hmm. Creativity is something which makes human being as a human being. Mm -hmm. But job <clears throat> takes away that creativity mm -hmm. because job only lets you fit into a slot. Mm -hmm. That becomes, a, you become a smaller version of yourself a tiny version of yourself. Why should you sacrifice yourself mm -hmm. to become a tiny version of yourself? Why don't you be big, as big as you're supposed to be and be an entrepreneur, be a creative person and do the thing. Once we include that, suddenly wealth concentration and everything changes completely. So the, all the fears that we have with the capitalist system can be addressed only by reinterpretation of the human being as we have at the center of the system. Yeah. You're so speaking my language. I just, I keep on thinking to myself, the job is like the, the number one problem that we have created. We've, we're now tracking every government program is tracking number of jobs. The indicator is wrong. Uh, and we, we go and we continue to create these things that nobody wants. Because if you really look around it, nobody actually wants a job. They want a vocation. They want to create meaning. They want to contribute to one another. And, and we're caught in this thing. And you're speaking about to me, you're talking about us taking back means of production. We're taking back and reclaiming our relationship with money so that we can become creators, co-creators of the communities and, and the places that, uh, that we want. Um, it, it's so compelling and it, it resonates with me so much. And when I, you know, I've been doing social enterprise work for, for uh, probably 20 plus years at this point. And, and when I think about the vision of what we're trying to create, you've, you've brought a, I call it visionary pragmatism, right? There's a, there's a visionary pragmatism to what you're talking about. You're saying, look, it's broken. It doesn't work. Uh, and so we're going to, we're going to chip away at it village by village, you know, replication by replication, trying to develop a new system that takes profit out of the system as the incentive and that puts people back into the center of that system and is based on humanity or the really the authentic relationships between people. And that is crafting a vision for me listening to you and, and thinking about my own work about what is it that we are, we are trying to create. Uh, and one of the things that I guess I, I, you know, being inspired by what you've written, thinking about this idea of casting a vision around, you've said th this the three zeros, and I guess I would just say it's actually a circle, right? It's, it's the three zeros are all circles. And maybe the concept of the circle or circularism, this idea that we can create uh, and use market tools to be able to internalize all of the costs so that we're considering all of the environmental costs, all of the human costs, that nobody is left out of these healthy ecosystems as we include, we put people and planet at the center of the way that we create our economic exchange systems. And to me, this is a vision that I think anybody can grab onto. It's not about what it isn't. It's about what it is. What are we trying to create? We're trying to create human-centered economic systems that put people and planet first. And we're going to have to be some pretty ragtag, 
visionary pragmatists to make this stuff work as we tinker with the system and we test and we experiment. And this is what you have been doing, uh, an incredible contribution and inspiring, uh, inspiring us to continue to tinker on the edges. And maybe if we all work together and we tinker from here and there and here and there, we can start to get to maybe, you know, uh, just maybe just slow it down, maybe reverse it. Um, but I think it's going to really force us to think about what's important and to shift our values. Um, yeah, I, I'm so inspired and I really need to open it up to the floor. Barnaby, how much time do we have for questions? We can go over a little bit, so 20 minutes. Okay, I'm pretty excited. Oh, we've already got the hands up. I'm going to stand up. First guy in, I got you, but let's go ahead. But please raise your hand. Don't be afraid at the back. I'm going to do three. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go this gentleman because he was quick. And I'm going to go the three at the, the two at the back. And then I'll come back up to the front. Go ahead. And uh, actually, do you guys need, yeah, you got the microphone. There you go. Uh, so let's okay. make sure that this is, everybody knows, this is an actual question, not a pontification. Absolutely. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, so just to be clear, you're creating enterprises which fund themselves, so you, you pay all the costs, so it's not a, there's not a profit going to investors and such, but it pays the people who work in the enterprise. So it is Nobody works for free. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so what is the challenge in scaling the model that works in Bangladesh to work in a country like the U.S. or Canada? Yeah. Same thing. If it works in Bangladesh, it works in the U.S., same situation. Uh, we, I was emphasizing right from the beginning of the discussion, we said we start one branch, one unit, which is self-reliant. It doesn't need to be fed by outsiders. It runs by its own steam, self-sustainability. So once you have the self-sustainability built in the unit, you can do millions of them, billions of them, doesn't matter, because each one covers his own cost. That's the whole trick. So if you can take, for example, you create a social business, the objective of that social business is to take five unemployed young people out of unemployment. That is the purpose of this whole business. I don't want to make money by doing that. I, all I want to do to have these five young people into that business so that they have a decent job for themselves and continue with their job. And as long as they work and the, their unemployment, unemployment status is gone by working in this business that I created, I'm happy. I don't want, I want my money back. In social business, you get your money back, but no profit. Profit is plowed back into the business. Now, if this business is making profit, I can hire one more person the sixth person, because it's growing, because it's generating surplus, growing that. So this one working, now I got the idea, can I do the another five? All I have to do, either I got the money back, so I put it in, or somebody else say, hey, I want to do that too. Well, how much money you need for five people? The X amount, okay, I'll give you, you do that. So I solved the five people. If you know how to get five people out of unemployment, I know how to get five million out of unemployment, because the same system. It's just tinkering about a little bit here and a little bit there. Otherwise, the system is the same. So you start with the small, but once you do that in a self-sustaining way, you can go as big as you want in numbers. Great. Question at the back. Yeah, go ahead, sir. All right. Uh, my question is about the unemployment among the uh, youth and newcomer population in the greater Toronto area. And I'm just wondering, is there any type of social business that can be used for uh, reducing the rate of unemployment among youth and newcomers? I just I gave the example right now before you asked the question. <laughs> now you can say, what kind of business would that be? If we exactly. take 10 minutes, each one of us will come with an idea how to create a business to make good employment for five people. And is it sustainable? Is a profit-making business? so that we can pay for everybody and create a surplus and return the investment back. It takes only 10 minutes to decide. We'll have beautiful ideas how to just to employ five people. Once we take the idea of making personal money, how to maximize profit for myself, then we are in the wrong direction. You take that out, suddenly you see so many ways. And each one of the ideas that will generate this meeting will be as good as any other one. 
So that's the only thing you can do. If you know how to take five unemployed young people out of unemployment, as I said, you now found the formula how to take five million out of, out of unemployment. Same formula. That's great. I just wanted to ask another quick question. And that's relating to the peer pressure that Grameen Bank uses and uh, the 16 decisions, because I had to work on Grameen Bank at one point. So like why such mechanism has never been used in the commercial banking sector in Bangladesh where the rate of default is really high, whereas Grameen has a 99 or 100% recovery just by using peer pressure? Well, you can ask the commercial banks <laughs> why they don't do it. Similarly, uh, we do it in the United States that I was talking about the Grameen America. You can ask the other banks in the United States, why don't they do it? If all the money pays back, they make the profit and so on and so forth, cover everything. So it's a question of uh, their way of thinking versus your way of thinking. That's all. Okay, next question. Who's? It was at the back. I think we had another one. And then we're just because the, the lovely lady with the mic has got a long way to run. Okay, and then who, just so I know who's well, next. Okay, we have one. Oh, shoot, I'm terrible. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, it's going to be at the front. Lady at the, the person at the back. Uh, Professor Yunus, thank you for coming. Um, I know this isn't related to microfinance, but I know it's something close to your heart. Uh, you've written a uh, letter about the what's happening in Bangladesh and the Rohingya. I'm just kind of curious as to what your thoughts are on that. Well, uh, this is not the subject, but since you asked that question, uh, this is a terrible thing happening to the people from Myanmar. Uh, the, uh, the United Nations has already called it a textbook case of genocide. So you can't be harsher description than that. And it's going on. And it's still a stream of people coming from Myanmar. Already there are 700,000 people already. Uh, their homes are burned, their women are raped and slaughtered and everything. Uh, so the world attention has to be put in so that an extreme pressure can be put into Myanmar government so that they have to uh, take them back and give them dignified life, give them citizenship, which has been taken away from them. Uh, so make sure they accept that. So there's a world community to decide. I'm sure Canada has, will play its role in making that happen. Uh, we have reports from all directions, every single source of uh, report coming, uh, say how much atrocities that are behind it and how deliberately they have been uh, thrown out of their own country and slaughtered them on the, along the way and how to now make sure quickly that it, has been re it should be reversed. So that's the only thing we can do right now. Put pressure on the Myanmar government, put pressure on Canadian government, to put pressure on the Myanmar government and mobilize the United Nations and human rights organization to make that happen. Thank you. Uh, we're going to give the next question to you. Can I just see those hands that were up? Okay, I remember those four. Okay, and they come in there. Okay, uh, go ahead. Did you? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I've been hearing you talk about younger women, and I appreciate that. I'm watching a lot of my contemporaries as they retire they're just going to have to live off a pension and a lot of them have had jobs and then lost them lost a pension and don't quite know how to deal with it is is there a, a time frame where you can get people to like do you you know sort of get them more thinking entrepreneurially because i've always thought like that so you know how do you do you have any ways of teaching people that I'm glad you raised that question because in my book, this is a favorite part of my book. I said that word retirement, that word should be retired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sure. Sure. Yeah. I said. The, the way I argued in the book, I said, human beings never retire. They're always active all their life. Retirement is an artificial word designed by the employer that you are good for me up to age X, 65, 60, or whatever. You're good for me. So, but this is just a fearful word that as the day comes closer and closer, 
person get very nervous. What am I going to do? I'm, nobody, I'm not needed anymore. The funny thing is, people are living longer and longer, more active life. They are strong in health and active in mind, but suddenly 65 years or whatever thing comes, you say you are, un, you are retired, the only thing you get is pension. Why? I'm still as strong as anybody else. I can do as much as I want. So I, in this, I replace the word, uh, I propose the replacement of that word, retirement. I call it phase one of my life. <laughs> what I served other people. That's why the retirement thing comes. For entrepreneurs, there is no retirement. The guy doesn't quit until uh, he's uh, something forced by circumstances that he has to leave the world. Uh, otherwise, he doesn't quit. He goes on. Why? How come if I work for somebody, there's a, suddenly a sword coming in that stop, you can't function anymore. Suddenly, I can't function. So I said, phase one, I have to perform all the things, duties about getting educated, getting married, getting a job, etc., etc. And when I decide that this is my phase one of life ends, I decide when my phase one life. And then phase two of my life begins. Phase two is the freedom of my life. It's the freedom phase of my life. I'm completely free. I don't have to worry about my children. They are grown up. I don't have to get married again. I'm all done. <laughs> I don't have to go to school again. I, it's all done. I'm completely free. I do whatever I want to do. That's what I'll be planning for phase two. <laughs> I want to do things which I never could do before because I uh, this obligation or this obligation or that obligation. Now I enter the phase which is obligation free. I want to change the world. This is what I, I want to see how much creative power I have in my hand. I want to do things which I never did before. I will be planning for that, for that occasion. And I decide on what moment. Some will say my freedom phase will begin at the age of 40. Some will say it will start at 35. I'll be free. I'll do whatever I want. It's us to decide, not some employee, some law. law they clear you at the pension so that you don't make, make a mess of it. You be submissive. You take care of you. I don't care to take care of me. I take care of myself. And I'm good enough to take care of myself. And I do whatever I want. So that's the freedom phase of life. And you are in the freedom phase of life. Welcome to the Freedom Face. Yay! Yeah. Woo! <laughs> and that's why the entrepreneurship becomes so important. You can do any entrepreneur. You become yeah. an entrepreneur. No limits. Absolutely. No limits. That's the best no, thing the best. ever. Okay, go ahead. I, I'm going to come over. Oh, you've got the mic too? Okay. But wait a second. He was first, and then you, and then we're coming to the front. This lovely lady here, and then Doug here, and then we're going back there. And then we're just going to take a breather. Because I can't keep it all straight. So, you're first. <laughs> Microphone. Hi. <laughs> Capitalism created an uh, immense amount of wealth. So, is there a um, bridge between what you're doing and all this wealth? You know, there's Bill Gates is doing a lot of good things. But I just wondered, we still have this disparity. Well, the, uh, uh, the way I tried to explain it, they said they already take advantage on the system. They accumulated all the wealth. Now we are told eight people in the whole world owns more wealth than the bottom 50% of the population. Jeez. Eight people in the whole world own more wealth than the bottom 50% of the population. And we all know these eight people. Bill Gates is one. Warren Buffett is another one. Carlos Slim is another one. Mark Zuckerberg is another one. You know them all. They're great people. We love them. <laughs> they own more wealth than the bottom 50% of the world. And the funny thing is, all of them, all eight of them, have already announced and declared and made legal documents. After their death, half the wealth would go into charity. So it's not that they're running away with all the money. They already declared that. It's called giving pledge. There are 180 billionaires in the whole world who have signed, already signed, more and more coming, already signed, same giving pledge. So you cannot say these are greedy people giving this money to the children and so on. Mark Zuckerberg is an interesting case. When the first child, a girl, was born, what did he do? He gave 99% share of his company, not to his daughter, who is born, newborn. 
he gave it to charity. Usually you think as, a, as, as excitement of having a new baby, you gave all the wealth to the new baby so that the baby will have a good life. For them. He didn't do it. He gave away 99%, depriving the baby. And the argument is, he gave an argument why he did that. He said, I want to make sure the world becomes a better place for her. Nice. So I wanted to give all the money to donations so that they will make it this better place. So you cannot complain this thing. Simply the system doesn't have any room for this. This is an individual decision. If we have a system where you automatically have done it as a part of it, that's why I said, why don't you, as you earn money for yourself, also create social business on the side so that you keep on changing the world using your talent, your creativity, your access to many things which other people don't have. You have it. Not only you have the money, you have access to many things which others don't have. Use this and change the world. All these problems can be solved if you bring our creative power into it. That's all. Human creativity can conquer any problem. But you do not use your creative power to solve problems. What you do, you use it to make money. Okay. That's the problem capitalism has created. So I'm saying that open the door. All I'm saying, give people option. I'm not taking anything away. I'm adding something to consider, that you can consider. And I keep asking the same eight people, why don't you create social business instead of giving money in a charity, yeah, exactly. which will go, rather invest. And then with that investment, whatever that eight people have, forget about 180, they given away. If these eight people's money is used in social business, the world will be a completely different place. Okay, let's, this woman over here, yeah? Hello. Hello. Um, Thank you, Dr. Yunus. My one question was um, regarding change. So in Toronto alone, there's a huge fintech community growing. There's so many technology-based um, finance companies that are popping up that are trying to challenge conventional systems and regulatory bodies to show that they're, there's a new way of doing business. Um, if there was one thing that you would like to completely revolutionize about the financial system, what would that be and where would you start? I'll change the banking law. <laughs> I'll create a law to create bank for the poor. That's it. Very simple. Once you create the bank for the poor, those things, people keep coming. It's a bank. It does it because that doesn't exist right now. So you have a half done banking system and only devoted to help people to have more money, to get more money. The basic principle of banking is the more you have, the more you get. If you have nothing, you get nothing. So we have to undo that. We have to reverse it. The, you have to give the highest priority to person who doesn't have any. In the early years, I was complaining about the banking system in Bangladesh, the way I posed this question. I said, you, you created a whole banking system in a very funny way. Banks are supposed to lend money to people. But you do it in a funny way. You, do, you lend money to people who already have lots of money. And you don't lend money to people who don't have money. I thought the bank should have been done the other way. Lend money to people, to the people who don't have money first, and then gradually go to the people who have some money. But you do absolutely the reverse. And created a completely reverse economy by doing that. There you go. Yes, it's your turn. Oh, what's up? Sorry, 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 sorry. Um, Assalamu alaikum, uh, Dr. Yunus. Um, as a Bangladeshi Canadian to me, you're someone that I really, really look up to, so thank you so much for coming. Um, so my question was, um, through these microloans, you've really started a conversation around gender inequality and business opportunities for rural, rural women, but women um, in Bangladesh and other places. So uh, my question is kind of a side question, but how does uh, gender inequality play out in your companies? How do you kind of encourage gender equality um, in terms of maternity leave or other labor laws or other labor labor regulations in your companies. Thank you. Well, Great. We do our best. There is some uh, eight, there's some seven principles of uh, social business. One of the principle is gender equality and environmental uh, concerns and so on. So it's built in the basic principles of how to practice it, how do you do this. It depends on each company, how what they focus on. Some are exclusively women-related companies. Some are mixed, both, rural, both men and women-related uh, companies and so on. 
So we do uh, all kinds of businesses, yeah, but the focus is always on the seven principles, how to implement those seven principles. Thank you. I'm trying to orchestrate at the same time. Excellent. Uh, I've got two last questions. You guys are going to keep it nice and tight. Nice and tight. Go ahead, Doug. I promise. Tony, thank you. <laughs> Dr. Yunus, thank you for thank being you. here. Thank you for being a uh, lifelong inspiration as well since my undergrad days. Um, so I, I have a question in terms of uh, gender equality kind of from the other direction. And I was most fascinated by how you dealt with concerns of men um, relative to them not being the recipients of the microloans. And the story of, um, of uh, Muhammad was a wonderful, wonderful one. Unfortunately, it's not one that's necessarily replicated within other religions. And I know that there are struggles in other parts of the world um, that don't have that same kind of uh, uh, um, experience example from religion. And there are similar problems within, I think, Western countries in terms of marginalized individuals now seeing more girls and women go further in education, go further in business. Um, and so what, what kind of explanation when you're dealing with marginalized people and there's an opportunity, for example, for women to become entrepreneurs, receive loans, microloans, and where you see concerns of the men and the gender inequality, the men falling further and further behind. Um, what kinds of similar stories, what kinds of similar approaches might we take in that context? Uh, I'll put it this way. One of the most popular questions over all these years of Grameen Bank microcredit uh, is why so many women? <laughs> That's a very popular question. Journalists ask us, individuals ask us, why so many women? And I, now listening to that, I kind of reverse it. I said, have you in any time in your career, in your life, ever asked why so many men? <laughs> that question never, was never asked. I said, that's the problem. I don't mind asking that why so many women, I'll answer. But you first tell me, have you ever asked why so many men? That's it, the way that we, our thinking process works. Uh, so we try to undo that. So this is not a man, woman, or something like that. It should be normal. It's human beings. Everybody's together. We had to do all women because there's no men, women at all in the entire banking system of Bangladesh. Not even 1% of the borrowers of the entire banking system of Bangladesh happen to be women. Nobody ever asked that question. In our 10th anniversary of Grameen Bank, 1986, we began at 76, 86, 10th anniversary. The Banking Institute, which trains all the bankers in Bangladesh, is run by the Central Bank. They organized a big symposium, their discussion on Grameen Bank. They are all bankers who were invited to that. One common question came in the 10th year. You should change the name of your bank. You call it Grameen Bank. You should call it Grameen Women's Bank. Why? Because 63% of your borrowers at that time, after 10 years, we are 63% women. 63% of your borrowers happen to be women. So you should make it very clear by saying that it's Grameen Women's Bank. So person after person raised this issue, elaborated more and more, among many other issues there is. So when my turn came to answer that, my answer on this issue was, I would love to do that. Yes, this is a very good idea that you suggested. But before I do that, you have to tell me how, ma how many, what is the percentage of men in your bank? Maybe 90%, maybe 99%. So before I change the name of my bank from Grameen Bank to Grameen Women's Bank, following your suggestion, you have to change the name of your bank. X Men's Bank, Y Men's Bank, Z Men's <laughs> Bank, and so on. They were surprised. <laughs> that was not an issue. So that is our problem. We got into this.
And I think there's a I think there's a really good uh, conversation there, a really big one. Yeah. Uh, we okay, I got it. I'm so sorry. We have another group coming back. I am um, uh, terrible at moderating those <laughs> questions. I was dancing. I apologize for all those people who wanted to say something. I um, th this afternoon has been an absolute pleasure. Did you guys have fun? Yeah. <laughs> Ready to go out and like start that social business more, better, more. Who's there? Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Yunus, there is no question that you have inspired many generations now, and you have, um, you are absolutely fulfilling your goal to change the world. And thank you so much for bringing your your experience, your wisdom, your insight, your creative thinking, your visionary pragmatism. Wow. to us here in Canada, in Toronto, and right here at the Center for Social Innovation. We couldn't be more happy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much.